Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the second in the series of four lectures uh, by our TUI uh, fellow this year, uh, Archbishop Michael Fitzgerald. Um, I'm Paul Lauritsen from the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the department. Um, as some of you know, I'm not a fan of long auditory uh, introductions, in part because every once in a while you get a speaker like we have uh, with us this year uh, whose accomplishments are so long that if you read them all, you'd be cutting into the, the talk. Um, so I won't rehearse his degrees, his publications, his many uh, posts, but I will tell you a story. Um, there was a student who came last week uh, who was taken by the, the talk and um, did some independent work afterwards uh, to learn more about Archbishop Fitzgerald. Uh, and he came up to me at one point and he said, uh, Dr. Lauritsen, Dr. Lauritsen, Archbishop Fitzgerald's a rock star. <laughs> Which I thought uh, about said it all. Uh, I wasn't sure I could improve on that. And, and so what I, the way I wanted to introduce him tonight was just to say, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more, was to say, friends, uh, we have the bono of uh, interreligious dialogue uh, with, with us tonight. Um, but, but that's not quite right, because as Archbishop Fitzgerald will tell you, um, serious and fruitful interreligious dialogue is not done at the level of the rock stars. It's not done at the level of religious leaders, um, international conferences. It's done um, in the everyday exchange of uh, people of faith sharing their faiths with one another, uh, sharing their spiritual disciplines, talking about their prayer life, talking about uh, their commitments to social justice and, and things of that sort. In fact, the Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue that uh, Archbishop Fitzgerald uh, once had it um, has a list of different kinds of interreligious dialogue, one of which is the dialogue of personal experience, uh, which involves that kind of sharing. And it, it strikes me that the lecture series he's crafted for us um, is an invitation for precisely uh, that kind of dialogue, the, the sharing of um, particular understandings out of faith traditions across traditions with the goal of promoting uh, understanding. Uh, and I, I think he spent his career uh, doing precisely that, um, setting the, the context for that kind of interreligious dialogue, uh, the kind that's fruitful, the kind that isn't um, of the variety of the rock star in one, one sense, um, but in the everyday encounter with the other. Um, and I'm just thrilled that he's here to share both that invitation to that dialogue uh, with us and to provide um, a beautiful example of what that might look like. Um, please uh, join me in welcoming Archbishop Michael Fitzgerald. Thank you, Dr. Lauritsen. Yeah, I think he wants me to sing for St. Patrick's Day. That's, uh, but um, this is not to distract you. I don't think it will. You will be distracted by this, which is on the screen. It is obviously the the names of God uh, arranged in the form of a of a lamp. Um, it's fairly. Um, simple calligraphy, but to my mind quite pleasing. And uh, so I'm going to speak about some of the names that are on that list. Last week was uh, an introduction, uh, in a sense justifying what I am going to try to do in the next three talks tonight and the two following weeks. Um, so, t 
tonight is a meditation. And as I said last week, I tried to uh, choose these names and put them in, in a different order according to the idea of the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. The 19th annotation of the spiritual exercises has perhaps become the best known of all the preliminary notes that Saint Ignatius put to his text. Now this annotation has led to what are now known as the exercises in daily life, allowing people who are fully occupied but who have the resolve to dedicate a certain amount of time each day to prayer to practice the exercises according to their own rhythm. This annotation says that the retreatant should first be exposed to the end for which human being has been created. And this refers to what could be termed the prelude to the exercises, namely the foundation or principle, according to which, and I quote, man has been created to this end to praise the Lord his God and revere him and by serving him be finally saved. And the name given to these talks, praise the name of the Lord, would seem to echo this foundation or principle. So, as I've said, today's talk will be a type of meditation. It will begin with the creation and then go on to reflect on what we can know about the creator in himself. We could state quite roundly that for us everything starts with the creation, or rather with the creator God. We're invited to place ourselves before this God with thanksgiving in our hearts for all that he has done and all that he is doing for us. At the same time, we should be aware of a possible twofold reaction. On the one hand, we become conscious of our own weakness, of the fact that we are not the masters of our own existence. We realize that we are radically dependent on God. On the other hand, we can appreciate our own dignity, which is founded on the will of God to create us, and also on the role that he has entrusted to us in the midst of creation. So how does the Qur'an present these ideas? Among the 99 names of God, there are several which refer to the Creator. And we find three of them in one single passage. It's Surah 59, verse 24. You, you have the texts on the yellow pages. Uh, you have some text from the Qur'an, you have some text from the Old Testament or the First Testament. The New Testament you know by heart, so you only have the references. He is God, the creator, the originator, the shaper. The last mentioned name, the shaper, indicates one who gives a shape, who gives an image, a surah, to something. In Surat al-Baqarah, the longest surah of the Qur'an, the second surah, the second chapter, there is found another name. He is the originator of the heavens and of the earth. So the verb used here would suggest the production of something that is new, a new beginning. And this passage of the Quran continues giving an explanation of the way God proceeds in creating. When he, God, decrees something, 
He says only be, and it is. And another passage from the Quran says, it is he who created you in the first place, and he will do so again, so that he may justly reward those who believe and who do good deeds. And we see from this that the creator God is at the same time judge. He has created, but he can also repeat this act of creation, or in other words, he can make creation return to him for judgment. I'd like you to imagine yourselves for a moment in Arabia in the seventh century, or in fact in any part of the world which is a desert. Just as the desert, which may seem dead, can come to life once rain has fallen, so those who have died once can have their life restored. In fact, in the Quran, creation is seen as a sign of the power of God. The power of God who is able to bring human beings to life again at the end of time so that they may undergo judgment. Each surah of the Quran, each chapter, has a name. And uh, one of the chapters of the Quran is given the name the Creator. Let me recite the first verse, or read the translation. Praise be to God, creator of the heavens and earth. He adds to creation as he will. Now, the word used here for creator is different from the first quotation that I gave. It's al-fatir, from the root uh, fa, ta, and ra. This root means separate. So here creation is carried out by separating or distinguishing the heavens from the earth. You might remember the paintings of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel where you have God separating, darkness and light separating. It, it is separating. This same name, Al-Fatir, creator, occurs in another place, and this time, again, in connection with judgment. Say, God, creator of the heavens and earth, knower of all that is hidden and all that is open, you will judge between your servants regarding their differences. And we could say that just as in creation the different elements are separated one from the other, darkness from light, water from the firm land, so also judgment will take the form of separation between the just on the one hand and the wicked on the other. I think there are two things which become apparent from these texts. The first is that in creating God is absolutely free. He creates what he wants. And that's quite different from the theory of emanation, according to which all things develop from God by necessity. This was a theory prominent in Gnostic thought, but also found in the writings of some Muslim philosophers who had been influenced by Neoplatonism. So God is free in creating, no necessity. Secondly, creation remains a mystery. The question can be asked, why has God created? God is al-qayyum, that is, he is the self-subsistent. He doesn't have to have anything else to justify his own existence. God is al-ghani, the rich, or rather the one who has no need of anything else. So, 
Why does he create? And the answer to that question surely belongs to al ghaib to the mystery, that which is hidden. And I think it's worth underlining that fact because Islam is often presented as the rational religion par excellence. And yet here we come face to face with a mystery at the very foundation of our own existence. And this mystery brings forth a cry of astonishment and arouses an attitude of thanksgiving towards the Creator. Read in the name of your Lord who created. He created man from a clinging form or from a blood clot, according to another translation. This verse, in fact, is the beginning of the first chronological passage of the Qur'an, even though it comes from Surah 96. It is the first verse of the Qur'an. It's a cry of admiration for something which arouses grateful recognition on the part of human beings. People, remember God's grace towards you. Is there any creator other than God to give you sustenance from the heavens and the earth? There is no God but him. How can you be so deluded? Not to recognize the creator, to refuse one de one's dependence on the creator constitutes kuf, this, the cardinal sin of ingratitude and disbelief. From the purely human point of view, the Qur'an considers such a position of denial to be pure delusion and indeed one of great stupidity. And God is the only creator and he's absolutely free when he acts. But he is serious in his creation. Did you think we had created you in vain and that you would not be brought back to us? No, God has created things, and human beings in particular, so that they will return to him. And he has done that with care. As we saw from the first quotation, he is al-Khalik, the creator, the molder. He is al-Musawwir, the one who gives the shape, terms which imply that God has formed human beings out of pre-existing matter. As the Quran says, he created mankind out of dried clay like pottery. And we find several times in the Quran a meditation on the wonderful creation of the human being. I want to show, share with you one passage, a well-known passage. We created man from an essence of clay. Then we placed him as a drop of fluid in a safe place. Then we made that lump into, sorry, then we made that drop into a clinging form. And we made that form into a lump of flesh. And we made that lump into bones. And we clothed those bones with flesh. And later we made him into other forms. Glory be to God, the best of creators. The we here, as everywhere in the Qur'an, almost everywhere, refers to God. The plural of majesty is used. The term for man, we created man from an essence of clay, is al-insan, which means the human person in general. It's not just the male. The phase, other forms, Later, we made him into other forms, might refer to the various stages through which the human being passes. Infancy, childhood, maturity. We'll stop there. <laughs> that passage just quoted says that God is the best of creators. Does that mean that there can be other creators besides God? Well... Today, with the progress in biotechnology, 
there are perhaps some who would claim this prerogative for human beings. But Muslim theologians in the past and in the present dismiss this possibility. And I think that Christians would agree with them. Recognizing that human beings are created by God is in, one fa is in fact one way of preserving their dignity. And the Quran invites us to meditate also on the creation of human beings as they are, with all their weaknesses, and yet with their wonderful calling. Surah 2. Prophet, when you told the angels, I am putting a successor on earth, they said, how can you put someone there who will cause damage and bloodshed when we celebrate your praise and proclaim your holiness? But he said, I know things you do not. In the midst of creation, the human person is placed as the representative of God, his Khalifa. Human beings, despite their being prone to violence, are therefore made responsible for this creation. Yet God doesn't leave everything to his representative. He himself sustains his creation. He is the provider, al-Ghazaq. And I think the context in which this name, al-Ghazaq, the provider, is found is worth noting. I created jinn, that is, the, the spirits, I created jinn and mankind only to worship me. I want no provision from them, nor do I want them to feed me. God expects from his creatures nothing other than their adoration. It is he who gives the risk, that is, everything that is necessary for life on earth. God, however, encourages human beings to look beyond this life, for the Quran suggests that there are other good things in store. Do not gaze longingly at what we have given some of them to enjoy, the finery of this present life. We test them through this, but the provision of your Lord is better and more lasting. So, to sum up, we could say that God is the creator, and as creator, he gives special attention to human beings. He sustains life, both in this world and in the world to come. So let us now pass from the Quran to the Bible, and first to the First Testament. We don't find there as many names for God as creator. Yet, since the names of God according to the Islamic tradition are often formed from verbs found in the text of the Quran, the same procedure could be followed when reading the first account of creation given in Genesis. In the beginning, when God created. So, God could be called the originator. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And this reminds us of the kun fayakun, of the Quranic text. God has only to say, be, and the thing is. And this way of creating through the bare word is often repeated in this passage from Genesis. It continues, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Or, and God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And so God works through separation. He is the separator, al-fatir. God called the dome sky. He gives names to things, thus fixing their nature, and at the same time manifesting his own control over things. Yet, as we see in the second account of the creation, God shares this prerogative with Adam, to whom the power and authority is given to name creatures. But returning to the first 
account of creation. God set the lights in the dome of the sky. He's like an electrician putting them in. Yeah. God blessed the living creatures. That is, he gave them life. And at the end of this account, special attention is given to the creation of humankind. And there is, first of all, a kind of deliberation. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And then God decides that this special creature will have domination over all the others. And finally, God created humankind in his image. And the special care which God took in creating humankind is underlined in the second account of the creation. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And as we know, this special interest which God takes in the human being arouses admiration and praise often expressed in the Psalms. Just one example, Psalm 8 which begins and ends with this refrain, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the psalmist exclaims, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? It's a mystery, really. The psalms contain numerous references to God as creator, and through all the verbs of action that are used, in, it is possible to gain an idea of the commitment of God in creating. An example from Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You set the earth on its foundations. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. And this psalm also praises God who sustains his creation. Thus all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. The First Testament insists on the fact that God is the sole creator. And we find this in the book of Isaiah, who declares, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who by myself spread out the earth. And the prophet Jeremiah, for his part, underlines the freedom of God. From the house of the potter, he proclaims, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as the potter has done? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And this would suggest a new name for God, the potter. Islamic tradition has not adopted this name, but it is an image which Paul takes up in his letter to the Romans, chapter 9 of Romans. But who indeed are you, a human being, to argue with God? Will what is molded say to the one who molds it, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one object for special use and another for ordinary use? And so with this quotation from St. Paul, we have arrived at the New Testament. In fact, in the New Testament, we find little about creation. Perhaps this is because the belief that the world was created by God was, went unchallenged. But Paul does write in his letter to the Romans, ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature 
invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. We can know God through creation. Jesus, in his teaching, puts the accent more on divine providence. And we know these texts very well. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither to toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the fields, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? It would perhaps be useful to consider what is said about the creation at the beginning of the Gospel of John. According to Christian understanding, creation is attributed to the Word of God. The prologue uh, attests to this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And the word is at the beginning, not only because of being eternal, existing prior to creation, but also on account of being responsible for the existence of creation. And now since the word has become flesh, Christian meditation places Jesus at the center of creation, as being at one and the same time its creator and its final goal. God does not create haphazardly, but according to a definite plan. And so by way of conclusion of this first part, a text about Jesus from Paul's letter to the Colossians. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It is through Christ and in Christ, that creation enjoys coherence. But what could we conclude from these texts? I think that we can say that we should let ourselves be filled with gratitude. Gratitude for the gift of life. Gratitude for our own existence. Gratitude for the whole of creation that surrounds us and of which we form part. If our sensitivity to the unity of creation grows, then we shall be more inclined to a feeling of confidence and to a desire to give thanks to God in whose hands we are. Now we go on to the second part, which is about the transcendent God. While God is the manifest, or the patent, a zahir, who makes himself known through his creation, he is also the hidden, the latent, al batin, who cannot be known fully. We are invited to turn our own faces to the hidden face of the divinity, recognizing how different God is. And this means reflecting on divine transcendence, on the holiness of God. And this should lead us to praise addressed to God for what he is and not for what he does. It should lead to a form of prayer which is entirely disinterested, not aimed at obtaining something from God. But we may discover that God, without our asking, 
will shower gifts upon us. For he is the living one, the true source of life. So first of all, the teaching of the Qur'an. That there is only one God and that he is the creator and judge is an essential part of the first message of Islam. We come to know God through creation and yet we find ourselves faced with a paradox. The invisible perfection of God is made manifest. How can the invisible be made manifest? We can say that we know God without really knowing him. And Islam exalts this divine transcendence. A number of the most beautiful names express this transcendency. God is al-mutakabbir. He is the haughty one. He is al-ali, al-ali, the high. He is al-kabir, the great. Al-jalil, the majestic. Al-muta'ali, the very high, the exalted. And I think that it's within the context of the transcendence of God that we should understand the name Holy, Al-Quddus, which is attributed to God. It appears only twice in the Qur'an. I think you have the text, probably. He is God, there is no God other than Him, the Controller, the Holy One. Everything that is in the heavens and earth glorifies God, the Controller, the Holy One, the Almighty, the Wise. God is the Holy One, Al-Quddus. And Quddus is akin to Kodesh in Hebrew. And of the Hebrew word, it is said, the Semitic word Kodesh, a holy thing, holiness, which is derived from a root meaning most probably cut or separate, this directs us towards the idea of being set apart from the profane. We could perhaps say that God is unclassifiable. And consequently, all language applied to God needs to be purified. We have to admit at least that we do not know how the same word, goodness, wisdom, mercy, can be applied both to God and to creatures. As regards the anthropomorphic terms found in the Quran, such as face or arm or hand of God, Muslim theologians have said that they should be used bila kaif, that is, without saying how. Yes, we go before the face of God, but we don't know what that face is. But we say the face of God, it's in the scriptures. So without, without saying how, without trying to find out how. This is, if you like, a negative approach. The apophatic way of the Greek fathers. A way which must be respected. I think we're often too confident in the way we speak about God. A good dose of humility and respect when faced with the immensity of God is really very healthy. As noted already, when speaking of the creation of humankind, God is surrounded by a celestial court of angels. And the angels proclaim, we celebrate your praise and proclaim your holiness. In other words, they recognize that God is above all created beings. And we are invited to be caught up in this movement of praise. For God is al-hamid. That is, he is the praiseworthy. And praise is an essential feature of Islamic spirituality. It is inculcated from the very first surah chapter of the Quran, al-Fatiha. Praise belongs to God, Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And I think it's worth noting the distinction between thanksgiving, addressed to God on account of his gifts, 
thanking him for what he does for us, and praise addressed to God for what he is. And the name Al-Hamid, the praiseworthy, really means that only God truly merits this movement of the soul. But this name, Al-Hamid, is often associated with another name, which I've already mentioned, Al-Ghani, the rich, the independent, the self-sufficient. Remember that God is self-sufficient, worthy of all praise. People, it is you who stand in need of God. God needs nothing and is worthy of all praise. As I said in the opening talk, this idea that praise is due to God, although he has no need of it, recalls for us the words of the fourth common preface for the Eucharist. You have no need of our praise, yet our desire to thank you is itself your gift. Our prayer of thanksgiving adds nothing to your greatness, but makes us grow in your grace. But can we know something more about this self-sufficient God, about what he is in himself? The verse of the throne, the so-called verse of the throne in Surah 2, points the way. God, there is no God but he, the living, the self-subsisting, eternal. al hay al qayyum We can say that God is the living one par excellence, because he is the living God who never dies. And that distinguishes him from all contingent beings. And moreover, this the living God is the first of the divine attributes, the one which allows God to act with power and wisdom. In the Quran, an invitation is addressed to human beings. He is the living one and there is no God but him. So call on him and dedicate your religion entirely to him. This means that one should associate nothing with God. Muslims often say, Subhanallah, glory to God above everything that one could associate with him. And in the eyes of Islam, shirk, that is associating something with God, is the only sin which cannot really be pardoned. No divinity, no other person, no, no thing is worthy of worship, for God is the ultimate reason for all things, the final explanation of existence, the only being that does not owe its existence to another, that only the only one that can never disappear. And this brings us to another name for God, one which appears only once in the Qur'an, a samad Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad Say, he is God, the one, God, the eternal. This name, as samad is difficult to translate. I have used the translation of Abdul Halim, who gives eternal. That's what the theologian Ghazali opted for. Yusuf Ali, another translator, adds the word absolute, the eternal, the absolute. The author of the article in the Encyclopedia of Islam on the most beautiful names of God translates this name first as the impenetrable. And then he gives a whole gamut of possible renderings. The master, he who reigns, the one whom the acts of his adversaries neither trouble nor move, the very high in dignity, the one to whom one prays and addresses supplication, one in whom there is no hollow, who cannot be divided into parts. All that for one word, three letters in Arabic, five in English. This name, Samad, qualifies the one who is unique. And that's confirmed by what follows in the surah. He begot no one, nor was he begotten. 
No one is comparable to him. So I ask myself, is it possible to reconcile all these different interpretations? Is it possible to find one single term which would express all these different shades of meaning? Well, in the Quranic commentaries on this passage, reference is made by way of example to a powerful chief who is not the subaltern of any other. One can therefore have recourse to this chief without fear. He will never be deposed. He will always be there. He cannot be impeached. So, he's not like the shifting sand, but rather like a solid rock. And so, that's a possible rendering of this name, a summit. The rock. This name would describe God as being eternal, immutable, indivisible, impassable, and yet one in whom one can always trust, one to whom prayer can always be addressed, one in whom one can always seek refuge. The difficulty here, of course, is that the invention of new names for God is not normally allowed in Islam. When I had written this the first time, I was giving a conference in Cairo, and one person in the audience came up to me and said, oh, did you read my article? <laughs> this is a, a Belgian, uh, who, Belgian little brother of Jesus, who is a specialist in the Quran, and he had proposed this same translation. I said, no, no, I didn't read your article. I came to this myself. But it's interesting that he found in Urdu commentaries on the Quran uh, that the, the commentators had used rock to translate this, this uh, name of God. This brings us to the Bible, and first, the Old Testament. Bear with me. God remains transcendent in the First Testament, even if he intervenes in historical events and is close to the chosen people. And he has the name, the Most High, Elion. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, the Psalm 18. Let them know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Psalm 83. And so the psalmist exclaims, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness and sing praise to the name of the Lord, the most high. And we could continue with these quotations. But I'd rather concentrate on the three names that have come up in the Quranic section. First, the living God. When Joshua led the chosen people into the promised land, he had the Ark of the Covenant carried in the van of the procession as a sign of God's promise that he would accompany his people. And Joshua said, by this you will know he is the living God, that among you is the living God. In Jeremiah, we find this name used together with others. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. And it's worth paying attention to the context in which that strong affirmation is found. The prophet has just spoken about the worship of idols, a practice which he rejects completely. The idols are false gods. They have nothing of the truth in contrast to the true God. These idols, he says, are scarecrows. They are both stupid and foolish. That corresponds to the Quranic term, Bartil, have no validity whatsoever. And Jeremiah severely reprimands those who are not faithful to God. 
He cries out, O hope of Israel, O Lord, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be recorded in the underworld, for they have forsaken the fountain of the living water, the Lord. Earlier on, he had pronounced to the people the word of the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Source of true life, God is indeed worthy of this name, the living God. But God is also the Holy One. And here we have a, um, a passage from Isaiah, the beginning in chapter 6 of Isaiah, which is like the verse of the throne in the Quran. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The prophet Isaiah, in fact, often speaks of the Holy One of Israel. In a prophecy, probably concerned with the invasion of Sennacherib, he, he describes vividly the way the Lord acts. The light of Israel will become a fire, and his Holy One a flame. And it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. It's obvious from this text that how demanding this holiness of God is. It destroys everything that is opposed to it. But it's probably the experience of the covenant of God and his people that gives us the better the best understanding of the holiness of God. We find this in chapter 19, but then later on in chapter 33, we're shown the intimate relationship between God and Moses, who can speak to him face to face. And in the Islamic tradition, Moses is known as Kalim Allah, the one to whom God speaks directly. God calls Moses by his name, and Moses wishes to know the name of God. And in chapter 34, God reveals himself to Moses. The Lord, the God, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And yet, God reveals how demanding is the relationship with him. You shall worship no other God, because the Lord whose name is Jealous, whose name is Jealous, is one of the names of God, Jealous. He is a jealous God. This name, Jealous, is not found in the Quran. But in the Quran it says that God will brook no rival. And then we have in the, uh, particularly in the, Song of Moses in Deuteronomy, we have the celebration of God as the rock. Of course, we know this uh, from the psalm that we use in the office as the invitatory, the first prayer of the day. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Deuteronomy says that the rock, his work is perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God without deceit, just and upright is he. We could know, recognize here other names of God in the beautiful names. Al-Muqsid, the equitable. Al-Mu'min, the believer, or rather the faithful one. The source of security and protection. Or Al-Adl, the just. But the Song of Moses has a strong criticism of the people of Israel. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. He abandoned God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. 
The contrast with Surah 112, Surah Al-Ikhlas, is striking. While the Quranic text, underlining the transcendence of God, eliminates all possibility of begetting, the rock which is God in the Bible is strangely able to beget. Very quickly, these three names of God in the New Testament. It would seem that at the time of Jesus it was fairly common to refer to God as the living God. In the presence of the whole Sanhedrin, the high priest presses Jesus to state clearly who he is. I put you under oath before the living God, before the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus, in reply, proclaims his identity. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. We find the living God in the writings of St. Paul, speaking, writing to the Thessalonians and speaking about their conversion. He says, for the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Paul speaks of turning to God and if the new converts to Christianity had turned to God, it was because God himself had first turned to humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. Among the beautiful names of God is to be found a tawab, the repentant, or better, the one who is habitually turning towards his creatures. And God manifests himself through his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was turned toward God. And what God was, the word also was. And what God was, the word also was. In him was life, and the life was the light of humankind. Jesus, the word made flesh, proclaims himself to be life. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. I am the truth the way, the truth, and the life. And so Peter proclaims, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. What about the Holy One? This is not very frequent in the New Testament. It's present, we could say, in equivalent fashion. Jesus addresses God as Holy Father. And this invocation for God was used very early on in the Christian liturgy, in the Didache. In the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, he makes a link between the name of God and holiness. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And Mary, in the Magnificat, declares, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. We know in the Annunciation, the angel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And so we can see that the three persons of the Blessed Trinity are called holy. Holy Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, the Son of God, who is also holy. Let me end with the, the rock. It's hardly present in the New Testament. We have to arrive at it in a roundabout way. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive. These words 
were an echo, they're found in the Gospel of John, they were an echo of a rite that was accomplished during the Feast of Tabernacles, a prayer for rain. It recalled an episode in the First Testament where the people demanded water and Moses had to strike the rock from which water flowed out. According to a midrash, the rock accompanied the people on their journey across the Sinai Desert. And Paul takes up this theme in his letter to the Corinthians. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. In other words, Paul is reminding Christians that they are to find their nourishment in Christ and find in him the water of life. We also have the theme of the cornerstone and the cornerstone which is Christ and we as believers are invited to be living stones uh, built into a spiritual house on the foundation of this cornerstone. Christ is identified as the cornerstone, the foundation stone which makes the building strong. At the same time, a living stone for the risen Christ is source of life, who allows all those who are incorporated into him to be themselves living stones. That's the end. Oh. No. One more word. What conclusion can we draw? Well, one conclusion, at least, is this that the names used for God in the Old Testament, or the First Testament, the living God, the Holy One, the Rock, are now applied to Jesus. Jesus is the foundation of Christian life. The command of old, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy, will, for Christians, be fulfilled in conforming one's life to that of Jesus. And that is the end. So we have time for a few questions. Um, so I will bring the mic to you. So if there are questions, just raise your hand. Come for more, is all I can say. Uh, this is only a part. Um, the, next, the next talk is on um, 
you know, the merciful God, God of mercy. So the second part today was on God as transcendent, God who is the creator, but, but God is also close to us. God is also involved. So God is not just remote and, a, and not a remote controller either. God is engaged, engaged with his people. And, um, but he has made us free, and that is, that is part uh, is another mystery. I spoke of the mystery of creation, but there is the mystery of our freedom, our human freedom, that we can refuse God, and we can be violent. We, we, and, but God is with us to correct that if we, if we want, if we respond to him. With, with your reflection on, on, yes, it's true that um, the Quranic uh, message comes long time after the, the message of the, the First Testament and also the New Testament. It comes a num many years after. But I don't think that uh, Muhammad was soft on the polytheists of Arabia. He was very strong in announcing the one God and that there can be no compromise. And, and when he was able to um, enter Mecca and have the control of Mecca, he purified this, the Kaaba. So the Kaaba is not, though it remains as, as, as the uh, a place of, of unity, if you like, uh, a point of reference, it is not uh, a pantheon. Allah was, which means the divinity, eh? Allah. So he, th there are other names for God, but they're not other gods. I, I'll speak about next week about a Rahman, the, 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 the name for the merciful God. And uh, when that, that name was used, some people in Mecca were rather surprised and said, is this a different God? No, no, no. Call on Allah, call on Rahman, it's the same. It's another name for God. It's not a different God. And this is really very strong in Islam. It is the essential message. There can be no other, and we can make other gods. We don't have to have idols. We can have money, we can have power, we can have pleasure, we can have all sorts of things that, that we associate with God. And if you really want to worship the one God fully and properly, that's quite demanding. How has your research, your study, and your writing affected your own prayer life? It's probably made me go to sleep more often. <laughs> um, but I'm consoled by the psalmist who says that God gives gifts to his beloved even when he sleeps. <laughs> That's a very... One of my confreres used to quote that when we were playing cards, and we had good luck and he had bad luck. Uh, uh, but um, I think one of the things that I said this evening, this, this facility that we have about talking about God as if we knew everything about God. I think Islam, with its insistence on the oneness of God and the transcendence of God, is a lesson for us. I think this is... but. I have to say also that um, I think that the study of Islam has made me appreciate my own faith even more, a faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and the mysteries of the life of Jesus. Um, and that again is a mystery, you know. I was born in a, an Irish Catholic family. And so I brought up a Catholic. I, I wasn't born in uh, Pakistan or Mauritania or in a Muslim family, and where I, I would have grown up a Muslim, I suppose. There is a mystery there, but the, the studying of, a, of another 
tradition, and it could be it could be Buddhism also, it could be uh, Hinduism, Judaism, and make you appreciate your own tradition even more. But I would like to hear a midrash moving that rock metaphor down to Peter. Well, when Jesus speaks and says to Peter, you are the rock, I will build my church upon this rock. I don't think he necessarily meant archbishops, but... <laughs> Well, as far as I remember from the, um, you know, the commentaries that we get in the Fathers of the Church on this passage, that, that the rock is not Peter himself, but the rock is the faith of Peter, and that is why, um, that is why uh, we we consider the successor of Peter, if you like, who was chosen to be the head of the apostles, the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome as someone who is to um, strengthen the faith of believers. That's his primary role, I think. But we notice that the present successor doesn't say, I pray for you. He says, pray for me. Pray for me so that I can continue this role of, of being a, a rock for you, a rock. But the real rock is not is not Peter, it's not Peter. The real rock is, is Christ. I think that, that you will find that in, the, uh, in the, the patristic exegesis, at least, I'm sure. Please join me in, in thanking the 